Hello and welcome to the Society of Critical Care Medicine's Eye Critical Care Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Ashish Khanna. Today, I will be speaking with David R. Cameron, PhD, on the article Nebulized Bacteriophages for Prophylaxis of Experimental Ventilator Associated Pneumonia Due to Methicillin Resistance to Staphylococcus aureus. This article was recently published in Critical Care Medicine. To access the full manuscript, please visit ccmjournal.org. Dr. Cameron is currently a research group leader in the Department of Intensive Care Medicine at Inslespital Bern University Hospital in Bern, Switzerland. Welcome, Dr. Cameron. And thank you for sparing time for us and talking to us all the way from Switzerland today. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Dr. Cameron, do you have any disclosures to report to our audiences before we start? No, I do not. All right. So jumping into this excellent work, this is certainly very exciting. What was your real inspiration? What started you off on this path? Were you guys seeing a lot of multi drugs? with ventilator-associated pneumonia in your clinical practice group. And tell us a little bit more about your previous work in this area, if any. Thank you for the question. So, yes, uh, so as you you may know that uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia is a daily challenge in the, the ICU. And so that's, that's where we started. And uh, I'm actually a, a fundamental microbiologist. So I, I've always been interested in infectious diseases and some trying to think about novel ways that we can tackle um, these, these clinical problems. So what are the important questions that are occurring at the patient bedside? And so, yeah, how can, how can we address them in, in new ways? So that's why we, we started working with phage therapy purely because, you know, we're, we're facing some sort of antibiotic resistance crisis where it is spreading through the hospitals. And we think that, yeah, complementary strategies or alternative strategies really need to be investigated. So that's sort of where this um, project kicked off from. And, yeah, based on our uh, position in the in the in- intensive care unit, yeah, we did show, choose uh, sort of ventilator-associated pneumonia just because it's of its frequency. Sure. Well, I'm looking at the authorship on your paper, David, and I do see that there are folks from the Institute for Infectious Diseases as well. So was this um, a collaborative work? But does this work really answer all your questions? And does this work also include some of your colleagues who practice infectious diseases? Yes, certainly. So it, it, it is, we have a, a nice translational team that we've developed here at the University of Bern. So we, we do have, um, you know, infectious disease physicians and we have infectious disease uh, sort of microbiologists, as well as our intensivists and uh, small animal surgeons. And so it was a, a very nice group effort, this, um, this study. David, why did you choose the phages that you actually chose for the, for this work? Was there any particular reason for this choice? So, um, yeah, that is one of the first questions that will all, always pop up because um, I'm not sure if you were aware, but but bacteriophages are, are one of the most sort of abundant biological entities that that exist, and so everywhere that you may find bacteria, you'll also find some of these phages. So how do we choose the one that's that's going to be best? And also, is it one that is going to be best, or is it a selection? And so, the majority of these phages that w- that we are using come that come just from uh, wastewater. And what we tried to do was we tried to to develop a, a cocktail. So this consists of four different phages, and we selected these phages based on the their capacity to lyse the bacteria. So they need to be efficient. They need to be able to destroy the bacteria. And they need to be able to have a like what we refer to as a wide host range. It's not going to be so useful if we choose phages that are only going to infect, say, you know, 1% of the bacteria that we're targeting. So we actually designed this multiple phage cocktail based on its capacity to, to lyse 90% of uh, MRSA strains that we tested, and that's what we started. So certainly this all started with in vitro assessment of our phages to make sure that we are likely to start with a really efficient sort of therapeutic. Sure. 
But then I also read in your paper that you choose a method of delivery. Is that method of delivery that you chose for your work the usual conventional method of delivery for therapy, for experiments such as this? Or is there a novelty in the method of delivery that you chose as your optimal method of delivery for this particular experiment? So certainly, I think there is some some novelty to the way that we approach this. So we actually, we nebulized the bacteriophages so that we could deliver them directly to the lung. So in a previous study from our group, we, we tried to um, administer them via IV. And what, what we found was that uh, maybe we could get, say, 50% efficacy so we would be able to rescue 50 percent of our experimental animals but then when we 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 uh were able to concentrate our therapeutic and we were able to nebulize it and and send it directly to the site of the infection which is the lung we found that we were able to improve the efficacy and so in the current study we actually we nebulized these phages and delivered them to the to the animals before the, the the infection, so I guess this is a, a prophylactic approach, and we were able to to um, rescue seventy percent of the animals, and we were able to really efficiently try to to minimise the amount of bacteria that was present in the lung, which seems to correlate well with improved outcomes. Excellent, David. And what was the whole approach of uh, prophylactic nebulised bacteriophage therapy in and of itself? Has that been ever done before or is this absolutely new into our world of critical care medicine? For, for MRSA infections, certainly this, this has not been shown before. So yeah, it's, it's novel in that regard. But so nebulizing therapeutics for infectious diseases ha, 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 does get done. So for instance, you can nebulize tobramycin for individuals that maybe have a chronic lung infection. So yeah, the, the nebulized d- delivery of antimicrobials is not new, but our sort of our, our application is is a is a novel way of, of of doing it. And how about your results in terms of pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetic outcomes from this work? So this is this is of interest. Um, so in a previous study, yeah, so we we administered the phages intravenously. And we found that in the absence of a bacterial infection, these these um, the phages did not accumulate into the lung. Rather, they they ended up being sequestered by the spleen. So, so this was interesting to us. But then what we found now is when we deliver these um, directly to the lung, so it's more of a like a, a topical application u- using our nebulized phages, we can really get these phages to stay localized in the lung tissue, which we think would be a would be beneficial. So, so, but certainly there are a number of questions that still remain about the uh, the PK and PD for phage therapy. Right, and we're obviously hopeful that this initial work is just a trigger for a lot of future work and new future experiments that you and your colleagues are going to do in this area. That's exactly right. So it did trigger a number of additional research questions. And so we're, we're tackling them at the moment. So our most recent studies where we're looking, rather than doing this sort of prophylaxis, we also now want to treat the animals that have an established MRSA infection. And certainly using the information that we learned from this um, this previous study, we were able to um, really give us a head start. And so I think that we're, we're starting to understand these uh, PKD our PKPD parameters a little bit better. And so, yeah, but still, um, I would say that there's still a lot of questions to be answered uh, because I, let me, um, if, if I may continue with that. So the interesting thing about, about the phages when it comes to that is that they will actually replicate when there is a susceptible host. So they will actually, the concentration of phages in theory, they should increase. When, when there is a susceptible bacterial host. Now, that is something that you certainly don't see for an antibiotic, which typically is only going to reduce in concentration. So this is, it's, that's why sometimes it's quite difficult for us to model and for us to interpret our data because there are going to be times when the therapeutic will amplify in concentration. And then on the other side of that coin is sometimes when we have very successful elimination of the, um, the bacterial host in the lung, what we do find then also is then we start to lose our phages, but that is actually we should we we are interpreting that as a good thing because we are reducing the bacterial load. This is fascinating, David. Just listening to all of this, I think this is just so intriguing 
to see how a whole world of bench research is in sort of a alignment with some of the principles of clinical critical care research. Now, on that note, you know, were these immune responses to phages, did you see some of these immune responses in your current study, the sort of immune responses you just described to me? So um, in the current study that we're discussing, we, we did not... Um... We didn't look necessarily at the immune responses, but uh, we have subsequently. So I can give you a little uh, taste of, of what we're doing in current studies. So what what we've found is that when you deliver, so because phages are this biological entity, so it's essentially DNA in, encased within a protein capsid, it will stimulate some immune response. Now, from our team, it's 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 not a, a a real focus of ours like so but certainly we've we've identified a, a marker which has been useful for us to look at the immune response and that is IL1 beta and so what we found when we have delivered this uh intravenously over many different deliveries over a 96 hour period is that you do see a, a spike in IL1 beta even in the absence of a bacterial infection so these are in sham animals. Now, that did concern us. Um, but then on the other side of that is we were able to show that when we did this localized therapy with the nebulized um, phages delivered directly to the lung, that we did not stimulate the same degree of immune response, which we think we actually think that that's probably a, a positive thing. But it's, um, again, that there's still some more... Um, you know, more questions that we need to ask with regard to that. But we think we do think that the, the localised therapy is advantageous over um, intravenous therapy, and that's just one of the reasons why. Correct, correct. And I'm also, as I'm thinking about all of this, I'm also wondering if there is any role for, you know, the antibiotics we use in critical care practice and how they would align with some some of this therapy and is there a role for any synergism with antibiotics and the phage therapy that we've just been talking about? Yes, yeah, certainly. That's a very good question. So we think, our team think that most realistically, this, this in its first iteration will most likely be a combination therapy where we try to exploit the possible synergies that occur between the antibiotics that are already approved and already well um, used within the ICU and then, and then we could uh, we could use this as a, as a as a combination. And so, what what we're trying to optimize in some current studies is to yes, is to add a perhaps an ant like a an intravenous antibiotic that that um, that can be used in combination with uh, this localized phage therapy with the phages being delivered directly to the lung. So we think that that's certainly um, worth worth investigating and that's something that we'll hopefully have some answers to so the best combination so yeah it's important to say which which antibiotic should we should we target um so yeah that's what we're we're trying to uh, look at at the moment so if you're doing mrsa would you generally target something like um iv vancomycin or would that be a most obvious choice yeah so Yes, it would. So we've we've tried the glycopeptide in the past, but however, this was um, this was IV treatment with IV treated bacteriophages. Yeah, so we haven't quite got to the point where we try IV ticoplanin with um, nebulized topical or like um, topically delivered phages, but we did not see any synergies with this glycopeptide phage combination. So we didn't see that in vitro, so we just in, in test tubes. And also we didn't see it when we delivered it into the animals. Um, the Some of the next questions that we want to ask is to, to is to look at linezolid um, in this context because it seems to have some potential in, yeah, in the context of, of a pneumonia. So we want to exploit some potential synergisms there. We have seen, again, in a test tube, so it's very obviously very different to our animals and obviously different to the humans. But we do see that there are some synergisms between linezolid and our, our bacteriophage co uh, cocktail. So that's something that we want to look in at, at in our model. All right. And David, I'm looking at your paper again. And the final line here on your conclusion gives us a taste for what you're planning to do in the future. So you write here, our current findings pave the way for future phase one or two trials 
that will address safety, dosing, and tolerability of phages in patients at risk of MRSA, ventilator-associated pneumonia, including those colonized with Staph aureus and expected to require prolonged ventilation. Is that typically where we're going for as a best next step after this? I think that that's, I would call that our long-term objective. I I do think that there um, are still important questions that need to be answered in our animal models that that haven't been answered uh, satisfactorily yet. Um, you know, but yes, the the long term goal is to to look at these in really well controlled clinical trials. Now, um, there's been uh, some recent well publicised uh, cases, so just individual cases cases where patients in di- with different infections have been treated with phages and has been quite successful. But um, we need to. Yeah, so we need to feed off of that uh, momentum to to get phage therapy into some yeah, clinical trials to to look at safety and efficacy. So I think, um, I mean, to date, few trials have been performed. And I must say that the the results have um, not always been uh, really like um, fantastic. But so I think that the, yeah, by performing more experiments with our animals, we'll be able to better design our clinical trials and we'll be able to push this therapy um, closer to the patient's bedside. And David, tell me, if I'm a clinical doctor in critical care medicine or a clinical provider, and I have no clue about any venture research at all, and I come across your paper, what would be that one thing I would change in my clinical practice today based on your results? Certainly, I'm not sure that this is going to be enough to change clinical practice right away. But what would be that one thing that I could take from this excellent work of yours to my clinical practice and take it to my ICU tomorrow morning? Well, I think that what we need to do is we need to increase the exposure for phage therapy just in in of itself. So there is a number of different um, uh, infective settings where it could be useful. So what what you might find is you might say, in my day to day, I'm challenged by this type of infection. And then you might already find that that somebody somewhere is is looking into this uh, into this question, and then it's something that you could work on together, and then uh, yeah, as push it forward in that particular field. We, yeah, we've started with with VAP because it was a problem that we continued to encounter. But then you know yeah, so each clinician might be encountering different problems, but we think that phages may have you know a place in all of these different infection settings, but they need to be tested uh, rigorously. Yeah, all the more reason that clinical practice and bench research should be talking to each other all the time. Because, I mean, the only good questions that are answered are sometimes based out of observations in clinical medicine that are then translated to to bench research and so on. Absolutely. And I think that um, at the moment, that's certainly a a strength of our team, is that I feel like we are... uh, asking the right questions, but then it is important to establish a team that, that has the capacity to, to answer these questions. So as I say, I am a fundamental microbiologist. And so when, you are, when you're treating a bacteria with a virus, then that is yeah, nothing more than fundamental microbiology. <laughs> well, Dr. David Cameron, thank you again for your time today. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, David. This concludes another edition of the iCritical Care podcast. For the Eye Critical Care Podcast, I'm Dr. Ashish Khanna. Ashish K. Khanna, MD, FCCP, FCCM, is a staff intensivist and anesthesiologist, associate professor of anesthesiology, and section head for research with the Department of Anesthesiology, section on critical care medicine at Wake Forest University School of Medicine in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, USA. Dr. Khanna is heavily involved in SCCM sections, committees, and task forces, and has received the SCCM presidential citation multiple times. He has written more than 80 peer-reviewed articles and two dozen book chapters, as well as editorials, non-peer-reviewed articles, and online educational videos. He has been invited to talk about his work at prestigious national and international forums. His research interests include prediction of postoperative respiratory and cardiac events on the wards, 
outcomes of hypotension in critically ill patients, and use of novel vasopressors in shock states in the ICU. Join or renew your membership with SCCM, the only multi-professional society dedicated exclusively to the advancement of critical care. Contact a customer service representative at 847-827-6888 or visit sccm.org slash membership for more information. The iCritical Care podcast is the copyrighted material of the Society of Critical Care Medicine and all rights are reserved. Statements of fact and opinion expressed in this podcast are those of authors and participants and do not imply an opinion or endorsement on the part of the Society of Critical Care Medicine, its officers, volunteers, or members, or that of the podcast commercial supporter.